Let's open our Bibles, please, to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, for just a moment, Joshua 1, 8. And if you don't have a Bible, if you'll just raise your hand up in the air, please, one of the ushers will get you a Bible. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Let me read it to you. It says, actually, let's start in verse 7. It says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper or have success, or actually it means to act wisely. So he's saying here that if you'll be strong and be courageous so that you can observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. This, of course, is God speaking to Joshua now that Moses is dead and Joshua was taking the leadership of the children of Israel. He says, do not turn from it, do not turn from it to the right hand or the left that you may prosper wherever you go. And again, that word prosper means to have success or to act wisely. So we're promised here that God will give us his wisdom. And then in verse 8, it says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success and when it says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth it means you shall be constantly in it so two quick thoughts here first of all that God gives us wisdom he promises to give us wisdom from his word. And then he encourages us to be men and women who are constantly in the word, that we're people who read the Bible, that we think about the Bible, that we uh, develop a habit of being in the word. And I want to encourage you this evening and just pray with you for a moment that you would make a personal commitment here this evening. If, if you are not yet someone who actually is doing what was just said here, if you're not a person who regularly reads your Bible, I'd like to encourage you to make a commitment this evening to begin reading the Bible regularly. And one of the practical things you can do since here at Calvary Chapel you know where we're going to be this next Sunday will be in Luke chapter 2. and We just finished Luke chapter 1. So you always kind of know, if you're a Sunday attender, you always kind of know where we're headed. So on Monday, you could just start reading the chapter that we're going to be in. And then when you come on the next Sunday, you'll know whether I told you what's in there or not, because you'll have already read it. But uh, that's just a practical way for you to have some kind of a track to be on. Read the Bible. Read the chapter that your pastor is going to be teaching you. One of the truths about Christians whose lives are effective is that their effectiveness is not the result of an accident. They didn't just all of a sudden become effective Christians, but they are people who determined to purposefully, very intentionally uh, place their minds in the Word of God and to think about God and to direct their hearts toward God. And so I want to encourage you, make time to meet with the Lord every day. You say, well, how long uh, of a time is that? Well, that's not really important. It's just make some time to be with Him. Uh, if you want to spend five minutes with the Lord, then spend five minutes. If you want to spend 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, whatever you feel directed to do, but make some time and take some time to spend with God every day and to 
read his word and to meditate on the word of God. So I want to pray with you here. Father, we know that your word is life-giving. It not only is what gives us eternal life, but it is what feeds us as those who have eternal life. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. It is what gives us wisdom, and you make our way prosperous. You promise, Lord, that we'll have good success in those endeavors that you call us to be involved in. And Lord, you know all of our weaknesses, you know our frailties, you know that perhaps we may not even have a desire to read the Bible. We ask, Lord, that for any here tonight who down deep they know, Lord, that they want to be in the Word, but they just really don't have that interest, but they would like to have that interest. And so we just join with their hearts quietly before you, and we pray that you would just kind of sneak up on them and begin to place within them an interest to be in the Word of God. And then, Lord, we ask that you would help us. We purpose in our hearts this evening that we'll spend some time with you tomorrow. We'll take the time to open the Bible. We pray, Lord, for our congregation this coming Sunday morning as we're in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, that the Holy Spirit might come upon us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And then I'd like to ask you to look in your bulletins with me for just a moment. Uh, there should be in your bulletin a little insert marked prayer requests taken from... Um, the Gospel of Luke, and you'll notice the very first request there, and I'd like to pray with you for this here. This is taken from Luke 1.41. It says, it happened there when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you please join me in asking God to fill you with his Holy Spirit? Lord, we know that you're not a respecter of persons. And we know that even in the rest of Luke chapter 1, that Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus himself, at his water baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him. We know, Lord, that the early church was filled over and over again with the Holy Spirit of God. And that it caused them, Lord, that work of your Spirit caused them to love you and to speak the word with boldness and to help them in every way to live their lives as committed Christians. And so this evening, Father, we pray for that filling of your Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And then lastly, if you'll turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, later this evening we'll be receiving the tithes and the offerings, but I just wanted to review with you again some principles regarding the subject of investing in the work of God through the giving of tithes and offerings. There's some great principles here in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. He says, now, concerning the collection for the saints, 1 Corinthians 16. So he's speaking of the issue of them gathering some funds that were to be delivered to some other Christians. As I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. So Paul was writing to Corinthian believers, telling them what he had told the Galatian believers. And he says, what I told them, I'm telling you, and he said, you must do this also. And so one of the principles about investing in the work of God is that it's for all Christians, not just for some. And so that's a good principle to keep in mind, uh, that it's a privilege and a responsibility and an opportunity for you. To the left of Corinthians is the book of Romans. If you'll turn with me, please, to the 10th chapter. And stand with me for a moment. We'll read a few verses 
and then get into our study. And I want to welcome you if you're just visiting with us this evening. We've been going through the book of Romans here on Wednesday nights, and we'll be going from Romans to Revelation. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, we call upon you this evening, and we ask that for any who are here in the sanctuary that are not yet saved, that, Lord, this evening they would be saved, that they would turn to you, that they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. We pray for those who may one day be listening to this on a radio broadcast or perhaps are watching on the internet this evening and they are not yet saved. We pray that they would be saved. And then, Lord, we ask that you might just, for those who are saved, that you might feed us, that you would strengthen us, you would give us strength in our inner man. We ask, Lord, that you might wash us clean white as snow this very moment forgive us of our sins cleanse us from all unrighteousness and glorify jesus christ in our minds and our hearts in his name we pray amen you may be seated paul in writing to the roman christians identified them as brethren he was a jew they were gentiles but what united them was their commonality of salvation in Christ, and thus he addressed them as brethren. And he begins to speak now about the deep desire that he had within his heart for his Jewish brothers who were not yet saved. He says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I think it's worth noting and it's helpful to be reminded that the people he was praying for here were his enemies. He was once like them, persecuting the Christians, but after he was saved, they turned on him and all of the trouble he had as a Christian came from his former friends who happened to be Jews. And so he's here praying for the people who actually wanted to kill him. They were his enemies. And Jesus uh, teaches us in the Bible to pray for our enemies. It's not easy to do sometimes. It can be very hard on our emotions, uh, even to think of someone who is an enemy. I find it difficult myself to pray for my enemies. It, it's uh, uh, perhaps you find it difficult as well, but I do know that 
that it is what the Bible says. And here, Paul, in dealing with the subject of the Jews, what has happened to the Jews, God's chosen people? Well, chapter 9 addressed that issue. They really had rejected Christ. You may recall that Jesus, of course, came first to the Jews. He ministered for three and a half years all through the nation of Israel, preaching and teaching. And it was the Jewish nation, the leaders of the Jewish nation, the religious leaders who actually brought him to Pilate and requested that he be crucified. And they rejected Christ. And so the Jews from that time even till now are in a place really of suspension, you might say. There are some who have been saved, but God turned and he began to do his work among the Gentiles of which you and I are. But he goes on, and I might just add back in verse 1, and I don't want to get too bogged down here, but I do uh, always like to note the linkage between the two things of his heart's desire and prayer. He turned what was a desire within his heart into prayer, and he was praying for the salvation of people. So for the people you know who are not saved, you can pray for them. Uh, you yourself were at one time not saved. Maybe your Sunday school teacher prayed for you. Your parents prayed for you. Your pastor prayed for you. Uh, your parents prayed for you. Your spouse prayed for you. Siblings. Uh, somebody prayed for you, probably, and you got saved. So for the people that Paul wanted to see saved, he was praying for them. He says, I bear them witness. He said, I'm a witness of the fact that they have a zeal for God However, it's not according to knowledge. They were misdirected. He explains their confusion in verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now he says, first of all, that they were ignorant of God's righteousness. Somehow it seems odd that the people of God would be ignorant of the very thing that God has offered to them. God's righteousness means how a person can be right with God. They were ignorant of how a person could be right with God. And their ignorance turned into seeking to establish their own righteousness. And so they had their own idea of how they could be right with God and as a consequence, they didn't submit themselves to God's way. And of course, that happens all of the time. There are a lot of people who are uh, excited about religion. They're zealous for God. But they really don't understand that the way to God is that you receive by faith Jesus Christ. You receive the gift of God. You, it's by the grace of God and by your faith in him People try to work their way to heaven by doing good things. And so when you submit to God's way, then you can be saved. If you refuse to submit to God's way and keep trying to get to heaven in the way that you've concocted, you'll never get there. You'll still need to be saved. And so that was the problem. They just weren't going God's way. You say, well, what exactly is God's way? Well, we've talked about it a bit, but Jesus said it this way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the, li the, the life. Uh, speaking of himself, pointing to himself, the way to heaven, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he added this very important part. He said, no one, no person, no man can come to the Father but by me. So if you want to get to the Father, if you want to have a right standing with God, if you want to go to heaven when you leave this world, you have to go through Jesus Christ while you're alive in this world. And uh, they refuse to submit to the righteousness of God. He explains in verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Or Christ is the termination of the law. 
The law could never provide righteousness based on merit. The purpose of the law was never given to save people, but rather to show them their need for salvation. And Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. The person who believes in Christ, of course, is saved. Moses wrote about this very matter, starting in verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. He's describing now uh, that those persons who try to work their way into a right standing, the man who does those things, taken from the book of Leviticus, shall live by them. In other words, if you're going to work your way to heaven based on God's law, you have to be perfect. You have to obey every little jot and tittle. But the righteousness of faith, now God's way for you to be right, uh, does not include this. You don't have to do these things. You don't have to say, well, who will ascend into heaven or do some great deed, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. There's nothing that you need to do. But what does it say? What is the righteousness of Christ? Well, here it is. The Word is near you, and Jesus is, of course, the Word. The Word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith which we preach. So he's saying you don't need to to try to be right with God, you don't need to worry about what you must do. You need to realize that it's really what you need to believe in, your heart, and to confess with your mouth. So salvation is readily available right at hand. And for any of you here this evening in the sanctuary or listening on the internet or by way of radio, you can be saved in the next five seconds. In the next five minutes, in the next 20 minutes, you don't need to go anywhere. You don't need to do anything. You simply need to do what is said in verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so salvation is a result of acknowledging who Christ is. You confess it with your mouth. Uh, you're agreeing with what God has said, that he is the Lord Jesus, and then you believe in your heart. What is it that you believe? You believe that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. That's the word of God. That's the promise of God. That's how you can be saved this evening. And if you are already saved, that's how you got saved. He goes on to explain it even further in verse 10. I love Paul. He just explains it. And then he says, well, let me explain it a little bit more to you. And then he says, well, let me explain it even a little bit more so that it gets through to us. He says, for with the heart or who you are on the inside, one believes to righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. So the way to be right with God is that with your heart, you believe the gospel. You believe Christ. And you confess that with your mouth. You, you speak to him, Lord Jesus, I ask you to save me. For the scripture says, and now Paul, and by the way, is, by the way in chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul uses some 80 verses from the Old Testament. He indeed backed up everything he said from the word. He was a man of the word. 80 verses uh, just in, you know, uh, proving his point here. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. The person who believes in Christ isn't going to find that they got tricked. You know, if you try to, if you think that by working your way to heaven, you're going to get to heaven, you will find out on the day of judgment that you won't be going into heaven. Jesus said on that day, there will be many who will say, well, Lord, didn't I do this and didn't I do that in your name and cast out demons? And he's going to say to them, depart from me, uh, you worker of iniquity. I never, 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 never knew you. However, for the person who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, you will not be put to shame. It's a shameful thing to have to deal with your own sins. 
Sin brings shame. Um, it, it, there's a shame inside of a person when they've sinned. And then uh, because shame is, is something that you don't, when people say, hey, how are you doing? Say, oh man, I'm ashamed. I mean, uh, when was the last time you heard anybody admit that to you? The, shame is something you try to cover over. You, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine, thank you. Uh, shame is, is a right, it's, a, it's an actual proper uh, sequence. It's the thing that happens when we violate the will of God. We become ashamed. We all know what it is. It's a shame. And, and then it's a shame to have to deal with your sin on the day of judgment. But if you believe in your heart, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame because your sins will be forgiven you. Now, right now, today, the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ, your iniquities are gone. God does not remember them. He doesn't deal with them anymore. You will never, ever have to give an account for those sins. They've been removed from you. So you will not be put to shame. It would be just the opposite. And he's saying, whoever believes on him. In other words, uh, it doesn't matter how bad of a whoever you were. You could have been the worst of the whoever's, but you still can be saved. In fact, Paul the Apostle said, I am the chief of sinners. And he said, I'm an example. If God could save me, the worst of sinners, he could save you because you and I, as bad as we may have been, we're still not as bad as Paul. He said it, that he was the chief of sinners. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Uh, whoever will call upon him, God, it doesn't make any difference of your ethnicity. He is rich to all who call upon him. And then he says it again in verse 13. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He doesn't say may be saved, you could be saved, it's possible that you'll be saved, it might happen someday, there's a remote chance if you're lucky. He doesn't say that. He says, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I want to encourage you this evening, if you are not saved, you do not have to raise your hand, you don't have to stand up, you don't have to walk down an aisle, nothing wrong with any of those things, but you must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You can call upon him right now as I'm speaking to you. I may be looking at you and you're thinking, why are you looking at me? Well, it's because you're sitting there. I mean, I, I, I could look at the wall, but I'm looking at you because you're sitting there. But you may be thinking, Pastor Bob, are you speaking to me? Yes, I am. And if the shoe fits, then please put it on because it's the shoe of salvation. You can be saved this evening. Now, in verse 14, what Paul is talking about here is the necessity of hearing the message and that you must make the decision to be saved. He says, how then, in verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's a very good question. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Two questions. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Let's read that again. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? You have to... How, how could they? They, 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 they couldn't. And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. A person of his own free choice must believe the message that is preached by those who are sent. You must believe the message of the gospel in order to be saved. 
Now, Paul, in verse 16, returns to the fact that they have not all obeyed the gospel, speaking now of the Jews. He started the chapter by talking about the Jews. The whole ninth chapter was about the Jews, and so will the eleventh. And his heart was broken. He was, as it were, willing to give up his salvation for theirs, but he's dealing with the reality now, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Remember, uh, even after Christ was crucified, the religious Jews continued to persecute the preachers and the Christians in the early church. They rounded them up and put them in jail and beat them up, and, and they went out and preached all the more, and uh, they martyred Stephen. He was the first martyr. And so the unbelief and the disobedience to the gospel continued and continued and continued and continues even to this day. But they have not all, all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah, now going way back in the Old Testament with a prophecy, says, Lord, who has believed our report? You remember as we studied Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, when God sent them to the people, what did the people do? They wouldn't believe them. Even as today, in churches today that are filled with people, many of them are church-going people, but they don't really believe in Jesus Christ. They've never really believed in Him. And He's saying, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Salvation comes by hearing the Word of God. So how precious is the Word of God? Faith comes by hearing. Uh, the importance of the Word of God being declared, and it brings faith into your life, and hearing by the Word of God. This is why your faith will grow if you read the Bible and stay in the Bible. But I say they have not, but I say have they not heard? Uh, now Paul is asking the question because remember uh, he's dealing with his concern for the Jews. He says, but I say, have they not heard? Didn't they hear the gospel? Didn't they hear the message? Yes, indeed they did. And he quotes now from the Psalms, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world, speaking of the revelation of God through nature from Psalm 19, every day, 24 hours a day, all 365 days a year, all around every part of the globe, every square inch of the globe, nature is declaring the fact that there is a God. But I say, did not, I say, did Israel not know? Well, maybe, maybe they didn't know. Well, first Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will anger you by a foolish nation. Now Paul gives us a little bit of part of the reason of uh, part of how God uh, is working through the unbelief of Israel while he didn't cause them to not believe. He is using their unbelief to provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will anger you by a foolish nation. The Jews look down upon the Gentiles. And so part of God's plan is to provoke the Jewish people by looking at Gentiles who actually have received the Messiah. Do you know there's such a, an influx of Christians that go to Israel every day, all year long. Christians are pouring into Israel, and they're proclaiming the Messiah of the Old Testament as their Messiah. And uh, part of God's plan through the church is to provoke to jealousy, to, to do something within the Jewish people to make them jealous and to make them angry by a foolish nation as they considered Gentiles to be fools. But Isaiah is very bold and says, and he's just going on now explaining the whole problem of the fact that they needed to be saved. But Isaiah is very bold and says, quoting from Isaiah 65, 1, I was found by those who did not seek me. 
I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me, speaking of the Gentiles. He prophesied that Israel would reject the Messiah. He prophesied that God would be found by those who weren't even seeking him. All those pagan nations around the Jews, all the, pa the pagan Gentile people around the world who weren't seeking after God, God made himself manifest to those who did not ask for him. You might in your own testimony say, well, I wasn't looking for God. Maybe you weren't looking for him. You weren't seeking him. But what the Lord did is he made himself manifest to you. He came to your life. And he brought conviction upon you. He convicted you of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment. He convicted you that your righteousness was not good enough to get to heaven. He convinced you that Jesus is righteous. He convinced you of sin, the sin of unbelief that you really hadn't believed in Christ. And he convinced you of the fact that there is coming a day of judgment. That's what God does when he saves a soul, whether he's five years old or she's four years old or he or she is 50 years old. The Holy Spirit manifests God to a person's soul and he brings the truth to them. And that's what God has done with you and I. We're not Jews, we're Gentiles. But to Israel, quoting again from Isaiah, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people, when talking about the fact that they weren't saved, he's saying, all day long. I mean, imagine if you've ever been in the military and you've had to stand and hold your rifle up like this, and they would make us hold it up like this. You think you're really a strong man until about a minute later, your arms start shaking, and then they say, okay, hold it like this. And you can hold it, and it starts shaking. It's hard to hold your hands out uh, very long. If you were to stand here and hold them out, after a while they would start shaking. God is not a human. He is strong and all day long he was holding out his hands and holding out his arms. He stretched out, he says, my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The people of Israel were disobedient to God. They weren't obeying him. They were contrary to him. People that you know today who are not saved, they're disobedient to God. They are contrary to God. And yet, do you know that God is stretching out his hands to those people? Do you know that Jesus was not sent to condemn those people but to save them? And do you know that God uses and wants to use the church? He wants to use your life as an expression of that love. And as Christians, it's, it's one of the weirdest things that happen. We, we start out on our knees recognizing how sinful we are, admitting it to God, begging God to save us. We get saved and we're so grateful. And then we go around and we start looking down our noses at people that are sinful and say, shame on you. You shouldn't be that way. We, we ought to say, listen, let me share the good news with you. I was just like you. I was worse than you. You can be saved. Well, the question in chapter 11, verse 1, I say then, I mean, if, if they're in such bad shape, the Jews, I say then, has God cast away his people? That would be a pretty fair question to ask. And the answer, certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now, what Paul is going to speak about here is Israel's future and their salvation. And he starts by asking this question, well, is God through with the nation of Israel? As he cast them away, he's gotten so upset with them. They were so disobedient and so contrary, he just said, I'm done with you. No, of course not. He says, I'm a Jew. I've been saved. I am also an Israelite. I'm of the seed of Abraham, and I'm a Benjamite. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. He repeats it in verse 2, 
God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. And then he says, or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? He's going to use an example now to show that God hasn't cast them away, uh, taking us back to the story of Elijah. He says, do you know, not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, and this is taken from the book of 1 Kings, Lord, they have killed your prophets. You know, Elijah realized what was going on. He says, Lord, they've killed all your prophets, and they've torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they're seeking my life. He says, God, don't you realize they've wiped out all of your messengers. They've desecrated your altars. I'm the only one left here speaking for you. But what does this divine response say to him? What did God say to Elijah? He said, Elijah, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, in verse 5, even so then, at this present time, in Paul's time, and even in our time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So, Elijah was depressed to say the least. <laughs> he looked around and he said, man, look at them. Look what they've done. Look at how they've rejected. Look, what, look how they act. There's nobody except me. And God says, oh, no, 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 no. I have 7,000 others just like you. I've got them tucked away. It's a little remnant. And it's a remnant according to the election of grace. God was reminding Elijah, look, I've made, I have chosen this nation. And I've got seven. There might be out of the million that were around, he said, but I've got 7,000 of them that have believed in me. They've not bowed their knee to Baal. They were men who believed in God. And even in every church where you have disobedient people to the gospel, contrary people to the gospel, there's always a remnant. There's always a group of people within the church who have not bowed their knee to the gods of this world. They are true, genuine believers in Jesus Christ. So, uh, it should help us when we start getting depressed sometimes looking around at the church as a whole or your own church. Look, there are Christians. There's always a remnant because it's according to grace. And he explains that again in verse 6. And if by grace, if salvation is by grace, in verse 6, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. That bears reading again. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. You can't have it both ways. But if it is of works, if salvation is of works, then it is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? Another question. Israel has not obtained what it seeks. And that's true. They did not. They were seeking a right standing with God, but they didn't obtain it. But the elect have obtained it, and the rest were hardened. While it's true that the whole nation hadn't obtained it, the elect within the nation had obtained it, and the rest were hardened. They had hard hearts towards God, and God just allowed them to go along in their hardness. Just as it is written, and he's va ver validating, verifying, and explaining what he's just said, quoting now from, again, the book of Isaiah, God has given them a spirit of stupor, or he's given them a spirit of blindness, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. That doesn't erase their responsibility to believe. It's just saying that because they uh, had hard hearts, this is what they wound up with. 
And, and there's a good warning here. If a person hardens their heart against God, you know what happens? They'll lose their eyesight to God. And you'll lose, they'll lose their ability to hear. I'm certain you've met Christians or people that have been in church with you and they're no longer in church with you or don't attend church. And at one time they did. What's happened to them? They don't seem to have the same mindset that they did. Their hearts have become hardened. They can't see anymore. They can't hear anymore. This is why you may remember in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus over and over and over, he said, be careful what you hear and how you hear. He says, because to everyone who hears and responds, more will be given. But if you hear and you don't respond, even what you have will be taken away from you. So the whole, uh, the whole focus of hearing from God and responding to him, it is so important because it enables you to receive more of what the Lord has for you. On the other hand, if you hear what God has to say to you, but you harden your heart, you don't respond to him, you'll lose the ground that you had. And so if you want to get going in your Christian walk, then respond to the Lord, be obedient to him. Move forward, be a disciple, really get on that path with the Lord. And now he says, and David. And so here you've got Paul. He's quoting Moses. He's quoting Isaiah several times. He gives a story of Isaiah. And then he says, and David says, concerning this whole matter, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always taken from Psalm 69, David affirming that same consequence of unbelief. Well, I say then, now Paul is just constantly bringing up questions. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? He says, look, if what they've done, he calls it stumbling, have they stumbled that they should just fall and be done with? Are, are they over and done with? That's the thing he keeps trying to bring up. And the answer again, certainly not. And so now he's showing that while the Jews may be on the sidelines, as it were, and Jesus Christ is being drawing a bribe to himself from the Gentile world, he does have plans for the nation of Israel. Certainly not. They're, they haven't stumbled so that they're going to fall and be done with, certainly not. But through their fall or their trespass, to provoke to jealousy salvation has come to the Gentiles. When you go back through and read the uh, book of Acts, you see how they started out ministering to the Jews. The first Christians were Jewish Christians. They were Jews who became believers in Christ. And then the gospel, then as they, re they started rejecting, then the, the gospel went out to the Gentiles. And we'll get to that in the book of Acts on Sunday morning down the road just a little bit. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And how grateful we are. I'm so glad. Do you know the early Jews who became Christians? Do you know they did not know that salvation was going to be for other people? They thought it was only for the Jews. God had to practically take them and shake, shake them and show them. They thought this is just for us. They had no idea that it was. This is why uh, when Peter went to the house of Cornelius, a, a Gentile, uh, he got in big trouble with the rest of the Jews. They called him on the carpet for it. And he said, look, uh, I was on my rooftop and I had a vision and God started speaking to me and he told me to go see this man and and God was speaking to that man at the same time he was speaking to Peter. And when they got together, he said, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And, and, and he said, it's the same spirit that's come upon us. And anyways, it was quite an eye-opener for them. And, and so thank God that salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now he's trying, let me get back to this, verse 12. You keep getting me off the subject. That's the problem. I've identified the source of the problem. Now, if their fall, 
is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? What's going to happen when they get turned around? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. He loved his ministry. And I might just add very quickly, um, I believe you should magnify your ministry. And I think anybody who knows what their ministry is, uh, they always think their ministry is so important. And you should think it's important because it is important. Every part of the body is important. You should magnify your ministry. You may be a behind-the-scenes person. Great. That's an important part of the body. You may be an out front person. Great. Paul was an apostle. And he said, I magnify my ministry. And you should find your ministry. You should be glorying in the fact that God has given you a ministry. He says, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. He said, hopefully God will use my life uh, to save some of them, and that should be our prayer as well, that God will use our lives to save some of them. For if their being cast away, the Jews, is the reconciling of the world, if the whole world, the Gentile world is being saved, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He's, he's giving us little hints now about the second coming and the millennium, and what God is going to do with the Jewish nation and Jewish people when he comes back to this world. It'll be like life from the dead. For if the first fruit, the Jews, is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. He's using the illustration of a... Of a of agriculture. He's saying it's, it, the, whole, the whole thing is holy. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, the broken off is the disobedience of the Jews. You, being a wild olive tree, we aren't Jews, we're Gentiles, but we were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, he said, look, you, you've been brought to salvation through uh, just like some of the Jews, and, and it started with the Jews. He now warns in verse 18, do not boast against the branches. Don't have a bad attitude. Don't be anti-Semitic. But if you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. I mean, if you think about it, the branch that's grafted in, you probably in school remember them showing you and taking aluminum foil and that whole business. I paid no attention to it in biology class, but I remember it, you know. Do you remember it? Well, then forget about it. If you don't remember it, there's no point in my trying to make you remember but when you graft something in, it's something that didn't start there. It came from somewhere else, but you put it in there, and it's, it's be, it becomes a part of the original. And you're not supporting the original. It's supporting you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. You're right. God used their unbelief to open the door for you. He didn't cause their unbelief, but he used their unbelief to open the door for you. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. So never to have this haughty attitude, you're saved, they're not, and you know more than them, that kind of thing. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he dealt harshly with them, he may not spare you either. So here's a great warning against not being haughty, not being prideful. Therefore, consider in verse 22 the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness. Goodness. 
if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. So he's warning against being haughty. He's saying, consider these two things about God, the goodness of God, the severity of God. And he's encouraging, continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Don't fall into unbelief. And they also, now he flips it around, and they also, the Jews, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? He's saying, look, if the Jews will cease unbelieving, cease being unbelievers, guess what? They're going to be grafted back into their own tree. And th there's a, a word of encouragement for you. If you are an unbeliever, you can stop your unbelief. You don't have to continue in it. And if you, if you will not continue, if, you'll stop, if you will stop your unbelief, you can be saved. And he's, as Paul does, he just keeps giving little explanations about what's going to happen. And, and he's really been describing for us here how God used Israel's rejection and the purpose of Israel's rejection. It, it, their rejection was partial. There was always some that were saved and and the purpose of their rejection is that he would reach out to the Gentiles, but the duration of their rejection is temporary because something is going to happen to the Jews. And he says it in verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, and it is a mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion or estimation. Don't think you know it all, he's saying about the Jews and the Gentiles, that hardening in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant or promise with them when I take away their sins. So, When the Deliverer comes out of Zion would be a reference to the millennium. We know that 144,000 Jews will be saved during the tribulation period, but when Jesus returns to the earth for the 1,000-year reign of Christ, it says here in verse 26, all Israel will be saved. God is going to do a great work. He's going to turn away ungodliness from Israel because it's his covenant with them. He says, when I take away their sins. So Jesus is going to do a tremendous work among the Jews when he returns. Back in verse 25, he says, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. This is the little word until means, it means until. <laughs> It's a, it's a time concept. It means that something's going to go for a while, and when the, the purpose is accomplished, when it's met its end, until it comes to that point, then something else will happen. And so God has a plan with the Gentiles. It's called the fullness of the Gentiles. He's now working, put the Jews aside through their unbelief and hardening of heart. He's working with the Gentiles, saving Gentiles all over the world. Meanwhile, the Jews are just nowhere, basically, hardly anywhere. But there's coming a day when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, when the last Gentile gets saved, as it were. Then God is going to do His work. Verse 28, concerning the gospel, speaking of the Jews, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. God has used all of this for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. A lot in that verse. 
For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God has made a promise to the Jews. He's given them a gift. He's called them. And his gifts and his calling are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. How beautiful are those verses. You were once disobedient to God, yet you've obtained mercy. And the reason you have is because God turned to the Gentiles. Even so, these who are now disobedient, the Jews, that through the mercy shown to you, they also may obtain mercy. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says when the Jews see Jesus upon his return, they're going to look upon him and weep. And, and they realize, you're the one whom we defamed. You're the one whom we killed. We're, we're the ones who pierced you through. They're going to be so overwhelmed with sadness and shame at what they've done, and God is going to wash all of that shame away with his mercy. He's going to say, yes, I am. That's exactly, you disobeyed me. You slew me. You asked for my crucifixion, but I love you, and I'm going to fulfill my promise to you. Verse 32, for God has committed them all to disobedience, or he has shut them all up in disobedience. That's, what's, that's where they're at now, that he might have mercy on all. You can try as you will to bring a Jew to Christ. You'll have very little success, in my opinion. You might get one or two here and there. But someday, he's going to have mercy on all of them. So having said all of this, Paul says in verse 33, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. He himself, who was inspired to write this, it's as if he just after having been given this revelation and written it down, it's inspired scripture from Genesis to Revelation. After he wrote it down and understood it all, he, it's as if he stood back and he says, oh, the depth of the riches. And think of how deep are the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God. He, he says, oh, the depth of it. There, there's, how, how deep is it? And then he says, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out that how grand he is, the eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, immutable, unchanging, merciful, just, holy, loving, gracious God. He says, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And to verify that what he just said is true, he quotes again from Isaiah. Paul really loved Isaiah, didn't he? They probably hang out in heaven together all the time. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? These are two questions. Who knows the mind of God? in terms of its depth, the eternal depth of the riches of God. Is there anybody who says, oh, yeah, I've got him all figured out. I, I, I took one look at him, talked to him for 10 minutes. I've got it all straightened out. Or who has been his counselor? Who has said, hey, God, come here. I need to explain something to you. Or did God ever go to somebody and say, could I have a counseling appointment? I need to sit down and ask a question. Of course not. Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? Um, this is an interesting verse. Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? Was there someone who did something first for God? 
Because if they did, he'd have to pay them back. I can tell you this. You can never outgive God. That's the principle too. And then he ends it here. For of him and through him and to him are all things. Paul had Jesus in his crosshairs. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, may I just say, as a word of encouragement, if I could try to add something here, God is the source and the sustainer of all things, for of him and through him. He is the source of your life. He's the source and the sustainer of all things. This globe that we're standing on, he's the sustainer of it. It's through him he created it. You have been created by God. You are his workmanship. Paul said in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God will sustain you. He'll sustain you. He will keep you. He will preserve you. He will not abandon you. He will never lie to you. He will not lose track of you. He will not forget about you. He will not be annoyed with you. Oh, he might be grieved, we can grieve him. He might be quenched, we can quench him. But the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. He's looking at you, he loves you, you're his child. You know, when you're at a picnic or some event, outdoor, indoor, some place where there's families and mothers and infants and toddlers and toddlers that... that next group up from toddlers, the, the real bad ones, the, you know, whatever you call that group. Um, second graders, yeah. But even with an infant and a toddler, you've seen how a mother in a busy room with all noise and everything, their child cries out and they just know it's their baby. There's just something about that relationship. It's, it's of, it's, that child is from the mother. You are etched in the palms of his hands. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Oh, no. Uh, so I won't forget you, says God. And Paul was encouraged. He started out saying, he started out in chapter 9 saying that he was filled with grief about the unsaved condition of these people, but he, he ends saying how great God is and, it's, and, and for of him and through him, but then please notice, and to him are all things. In other words, the purpose of all that is of him and through him is to him. You are of him. You are through him. He sustains you. And your life is to be to him. Your life is to be for him. That's what you were created for. So many Christians are depressed. So many Christians are complaining and moaning and griping and laying blame and judging this and that within their own churches because they're unhappy well, maybe the problem lies within themselves. I've never really met an unhappy person. I've never really met a person who is full on for Jesus Christ who is really unhappy. Oh, they get depressed. They have their moments. They get attacked. 
But you know what? They are a ball of happiness. They're full of the joy of the Lord. They have a sense of purpose. They're in touch with God. They know where they're going. They know where they've come from. They're aware of heaven and aware of hell. They know that they were once not saved and they are now saved. They're alive in Christ. They're awake. They're not asleep. They're, they're hot, not cold or lukewarm. That's if you're living to him. And really, this is what God wants you to be. He wants you to be to him. So next time someone says, how are you doing? Say, to him. They're going to think, what is the matter with you? And then you can say, well, no, no, what's the matter with you? You can say, are you to him? Are you with me? It's code for commitment. Starts with the Bible. You remember we talked about commit to read your Bible? Do you know how you get to him? Through his word coming to you. And through you surrendering yourself to his word. Submitting yourself to God's word. Letting God shape you. He's the potter. He's in charge. So, he'll get you to him if he can get to you. He wants to get to you with his word. If you abide in his word, you are his disciple. This is why the word of God is so, 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 so important. And then he says, finally, and you guys are saying glory. I know, I know. He says, to whom be glory forever. Oh, do you know it's so exciting when you've had a hankering to have some Kentucky fried chicken? And you start thinking about, I'm not going to just get the, I'm not, definitely not getting the grilled. I'm not getting the original. I'm getting the extra crispy. And you can think about it for a few days, or I'm going to go to in and out and and you know the secret menu. You can ask for the special extra heart attack stuff they put on there. And man, it's just, you think about it, and you're going to go here, and you're going to, go on a cruise and you're going to, oh, they've got those restaurants and whatever it is you're thinking about. Well, I'll tell you, you might even feel that way about the biscuits and gravy here on Sunday morning. I had them once and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I thought, what did I just do this morning? Why do I have this lead ball in my stomach? It's our biggest seller in the cafe. We sell stomach aches here every Sunday morning. That's another story. Oh, and then you got bacon on there. Man, here's the deal. You say, where are you going with this? I'm almost there. You eat that extra crispy fried chicken. Or how about Chinese food? Oh, it's so good, isn't it? Good Chinese food. But do you know what? About 30 minutes later, you feel what? Empty. That's why they always give you those little baskets to take them home. Because they know you're going to feel, oh, you're stuffed. You, you go to a Chinese restaurant, they start bringing it out. One bowl, another bowl, another dish, and it's just everywhere. They don't, you don't even have room. And in 30 minutes, you're hungry again. Listen, what we have now in Christ, of him, through him, to him, it's a little down payment on what is coming forever. We see through a glass darkly now, but then to whom be glory forever. Yeah, forever. So that's, that's the glorious hope that we have. It's forever, and, and he will forever, Ephesians 1, it tells us, he will forever be revealing to us the riches of his grace. 
In other words, we'll never, ever see it all because he'll forever be revealing it to us. It's not like go to this last room, that's after a thousand rooms, go to the last one, that's the final prize for you. And then he says, amen, because he was a good Baptist. He said, amen. You know what the word amen means? It means, yes, indeed, so be it, I agree. That's what he's saying. Is I, he's saying, I agree with what I just said. So, next week, Romans chapter 12. You might begin reading ahead. What a great three chapters these are. And I'm glad that we're done with them because they're, they're hard, they're difficult chapters, but they get better as you go. Let's have our ushers please come up. We'll receive the tithes and the offerings. Please read your Bibles tomorrow. Take some time to be with the Lord. Uh, how do you make that commitment that you've made tonight? You've, if you've made that commitment, how do you turn a commitment into a habit? That's a fair question. You know how you turn a commitment into a habit? You must really want to do it. You know what Daniel did? He purposed in his heart. If you're going to make something habitual, you need to make a strong decision to carry out your resolve. It, I don't care what you're thinking about. That's what you've got to do. So let's be Bible readers, okay? Read Luke chapter 2. Read Romans chapter 12. That will keep you busy. Let's pray. Father, thank you, and we can't say anything more. Uh, we're just like Paul. What can we say? But we do bring to you your tithe in these offerings. We pray, Lord, that you would one day, even soon, open a window in heaven and pay the mortgage off here at Calvary Chapel. Bless this church, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.